Uh, hello. Uh, we are welcoming you in uh, email for Laser Talk Brussels. And uh, I would like to introduce, first of all, myself. I'm Alexandra Dementieva, and I'm creating Laser Talk Brussels in collaboration with Eddie Dooley, who is just uh, uh, near me. And uh, I would just, we'll start just, uh, unfortunately, our panelists, uh, they are virtual, but uh, they are with us. This is Peter de Couper and Pete DeWors. So uh, sometimes uh, the life is always changing things in the last moment. And uh, I would like to tell a few words uh, before to start the discussion that our, this is our seventh uh, talk and series in which we will discuss the olfactory experience that could be also function as a new language. I uh, also would like to say a few words about uh, the organization itself, because uh, Laser Talk, this is a part of the different activities of Leonardo, and this is a talks that bring different kinds of the uh, participants, like artists, scientists, humanists, together for informal presentation, performances, conversation with the wider public. And the mission of Lazy Talk is to encourage contribution to the cultural environment of the region by fostering interdisciplinary dialogue and opportunity for community building. This time also, this is quite exceptional that we are the part, Laser Talk, I mean a part a si of site event of the festival of the new European Bauhaus that also have the mission to bring the European Green Deal at the heart of our daily lives. And uh, I would like to uh, start with introducing you to our moderator of Laser Talk, this Edith Dove. She is a curator, writer, and researcher, especially interested in the notion of emergence and contingency, cross and transdisciplinary collaboration. She holds a PhD as member of the Trans Technology Research at Plymouth University. And since 2018, she lives and works in France, currently in Rouen, where she teaches at the ACID Ecole Supérieure of Art and Design de Havre, Rouen. And she is postdoctoral advisor with the Trans Technology Research, regular contributor to the Leonardo Reviews, moderator of Leonardo Laser Talk of Brussels. And uh, so I will pass the floor to Edith. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you for being here. And thank you for uh, maybe following us online. Um, the talk will be recorded so uh, and will be distributed afterwards. I'm really pleased if only uh, if be it be it so so uh, excuse me uh, virtually to greet uh, Peter de Cupre and Peter Voss um, and uh, quite excited to talk about this subject. It's kind kind of funny that because the last two times I wasn't able to be here due to COVID, and now that I'm here, the guests are uh, are here only virtually. Uh, but anyway, uh, my first encounter with anything to do with smell, as for many people, was probably Patrick Suskin's book, The Perfume, which was published, I think, in 1983. Uh, in which he uh, talks amazingly also about the smells of, and, and uh, especially the bad smells of, uh, of Paris. Uh, and then the guy who tries to uh, develop a perfume that sort of obliterates the bad smells. So that might be an interesting topic to discuss later on. Um, and I found recent research that has shown that the structure of the odor molecule determines whether a smell is considered pleasant or not. The researchers found that certain smells were liked more than others, regardless of the cultural affiliation of participants. Cultures around the world rank different orders in a similar way, no matter where they come from. 
but older preferences have a personal, although not cultural, component, uh, according to Dr. Asha Miyan, who had, has led this uh, research. And the odors the participants were asked to rank included vanilla, which smelled best, then followed by ethyl butyrate, which smells like peaches. The smell that most participants considered the least pleasant was isovaleric acid, which can be found in many foods, such as cheese, soy milk, and apple juice, but also in food sweat. And according to Dr. Asamian, a possible reason why people consider some smells more pleasant than others, regardless of culture, is that such odors increase the chances of survival during human evolution. So the guests that we're having today both uh, uh, work with smell, and, and uh, Peter de Cooper I know already for a long, long time, because I think I first met you at HISC, uh, and I also had the pleasure of working with you. Uh, you've been working as an artist for more than 25 years with smells or odors, and you are today seen as the most prolific and proactive proponent of olfactory art in the world. Um, as I said, I had the pleasure of working with you now already almost 20 years ago for a group show at uh, Pam Eename. Uh, but in the meantime, you exhibited worldwide in more than 200 exhibitions. You are a lecturer at PXL Math School of Arts in Hasselt, where you teach on the senses in art. And in 2019, you received your doctor title for your research about the sense of smell, uh, which could be used or can be used as a context or uh, be the context of a work of art. And currently, you present a large selection of uh, your work as part of the exhibition Le Jardin d'Eden at Lille 3000, Utopia, at the Église Saint-Marie Madeleine and uh, the Maison Folie Moulin, curated by the LSD2 creators, which runs until October 2nd. So we have plenty of time to go see and smell that. So um, can you present your work, please? Yes, thank you, um, Edith. I'm very grateful to be invited here today. Um, so I'm Peter Le Cooper, olfactory artist and researcher at the, and teaching at the PXL Met School of Arts in Hasselt. So, uh, um, so uh, I teach uh, the use of the nearby senses in art with a focus on olfactory art. And at the moment, I'm doing uh, research on how to use 3D printing in combination with standard materials. And then here we come in 2003, edits. Uh, he invited me to realize this in situ installation in Enamen in Belgium. I had very good memories on this project as it allowed me to integrate 974 fake snakes in the environment and nearby places in the city of Enamen. These snails were made of epoxy and covered with scented smile. So I think it's one of my most beautiful projects that uh, I have good memories on also. So, uh, so as a short introduction, I will show uh, some works that are now on show in Lille 3000 in the exhibition Chardin Deden, and curated by the, like uh, Edith uh, says, uh, the LSD2 curators, uh, Sigrid Demetener and uh, Sophie Lachertz. And secondly, I discuss some works that have a relationship with the alphabet, the olfactory alphabet, as a kind of introduction for uh, or later to talk about the alphabet. So this work, when the air dries out, is a visible, beautiful Persian carpet made from spices that changes into a desert landscape in the center of the carpet. It smells delicious, although this work seems to evoke some happiness and olfactory pleasure to the viewer. Nevertheless, it has a less beautiful reason why I created it. The work goes about global warming, uh, one of the result of global warming is that it will become more difficult to pro provide sufficient food for the growing wild population. When the, when the air dries out, uh, wants to take the viewer into the consciousness that there is another side to all that mankind has made beautiful in our world. What is left behind is a desert. Uh, although made from expensive Persian spices, it remains only spices, spices which may change the taste of food of life, but with which it is not possible to survive on their own. Fragum Cardemoni, a work from 2012, is the first scratch and sniff sculpture in the world. Visitor can discover the smell by scratching it and smelling their fingers. 
I want to represent the environmental issues in a subtle way and letting them raise questions about possible future models. And this is where flower cardamone comes in. The idea behind it is that because of the increase in the wild population and the reduction of fertile soil because of climate change, one should try to achieve, achieve sorry, greater food production on a smaller surface. The profit per surface area is thus greater. For example, growing strawberries on the flower sculpture saves a lot of land than spreading them over a ground surface. The idea is that not only do plants grow along the outside, but also the inside provides production. Mushrooms can be grown along the inside, which also provide extra humus for the outside and vice versa. But the accompanying miscellaneum also makes the outside stronger to hold the soil together. Uh, the strawberries or plants growing on the stems can be planted and harvested with drones. The technolo technology is already in existence for that. Uh, the whole work seems futuristic and utopian, but I believe in its possibilities. And beyond the fact that it has pro uh, productivity as its starting point, it also contributes visually to the landscape. Smoke cloud allows the viewer to climb a ladder and put their head through a hole in a cloud. With their heads in the clean, soft, white cloud, the spectator is confronted with a perhaps unexpected smell, air pollution. Uh, the artwork was exhibited in Argentina, Brazil, Cuba, Denmark, and the Netherlands, and the intensity of the smell was altered according to location, and is now on view in Lille, in France. But how bad would air pollution be if trees polluted the air? The power of factory tree, uh, this work, is, uh, lies in the simplicity of inverting the relationship of humans to nature by having a tree serve as a chimney and no longer as an air purifying lung, I want to challenge the viewer to think about the typical what if question. What if nature rather than humanity was a polluter? The use of a synthetic natural smell is also a deliberate illustration of the typical ways in which we camouflage our mistakes. In the same space covered by the smoke of the factory tree is hanging the olfactory tree, a fake tree made of, of, of epoxy, nine meters long. In the middle of the tree are holes where you can look inside a wider part, kind of cancer tree bulb. Looking inside the tree, you see uh, the same tree in a little version, totally burnt and smelling very intensive to burnt trees. For the exhibition Garden of Aten, I created also five new salt flowers. Uh, four salt flowers can be discovered in a specially made white space behind the olfactory tree, where one has to walk on salt to discover the salt flowers. All four have an odor of how the sea would smell in the future on a different geographical sea location. The power of the works lies not only in the visuality of the flowers, but also in the choice of fragrances. This is because the sea does not smell the same everywhere. Even at a short distance, the smell can vary greatly. But also weather influences and climate change and human have an impact on the smell of the sea. And then there is the utopian idea of how the smell would change in the future. Visually, visually the flowers are aesthetical white some little beige, and the crystals sparkle in the light. I managed to bind tiny salt grains together into crystal-like shapes and grow them on 3D, 3D printed designed flowers. They become daisy, uh, daisy, daisy jewels-like sculpture, as it were. As the salt flowers are very sensitive and fragile, just like nature is, they are protected with a plexi uh, The To experience their scent, people can smell the salt flowers through holes and of uh, 3D printed filters. Uh, the flowers are designed in various 3D programs and printed in PLA, a 3D material that is made from corn. Um, it's eco-friendly and can be recycled. Then I let the salt flowers grow on the 3D prints for a long time. It took a long research to manage to find out which kind of salt to use and how to let the salt crystals grow on the 3D prints. A fifth salt flower can be discovered in the church Madeleine, where it's hidden in a confession box. Looking through the holes, the salt flowers appear visibly the same as the other salt flowers. But when the light goes out, 
the salt flowers lights up fluorescent green. The smell is not one of an utopian sea, but rather a chemical smell that could refer to medication. Most visitors will not find it a pleasant smell, as one immediately links uh, to disease and chemistry. Here, human attention is drawn to the danger of how the use of chemicals and radioactive waste help determine the future of our nature. How will we, how will we confess in the future with this? I now discuss some works that have a relationship with the alphabet. Uh, the, olfa, the olfactiano uh, works like a mix of a piano and an organ. The keys of the sand piano are subdivided into three layers, just like the three notes in a perfume, bass, middle, and top notes. The olfactiano has 27 keys, allowing to create more than 4,374 different scent combinations, depending on the desired scent intensity. There are 27 specific scents, or rather 26, I should say, uh, as one is a scent divider that is left open to fill the room with fresh air. The, the idea of using 26 fragrances, fragrances was already based on the idea to create a scent alphabet. So instead of actually reading a book, you could simply close your eyes and focus on the fragrances and the way they mix. Most concerts take between seven and 15 minutes. To help me prepare my scent concerts, I developed a dedicated computer program that allows me to prepare the concerts properly. I just had to check the scent scores on my laptop. You see here three examples of such a score. And Dolfactiano was in this way also kind of predecessor, uh, predecessor of the alphabet. Then the blind smell stick, a work from 2012 realized for an exhibition in Rio de Janeiro. Find your way by smelling. With the blind smell stick, you redesign your own perception of a given location. By navigating via smells, you experience the city differently. You smell the ground and all the miasma you can encounter along the way. An experienced smeller would be able to find his way uh, or her way back to the follow, uh, back by following the smells. The blind smell stick is an instinctive device. It allows you to refocus on your own instinctive behavior. Depending on the smell you perceive, you will walk a bit further or take a different route or take a short break to take in the unexpectedly rich olfactory palette. If we give every street a different smell, we could determine where we are in the city purely on the basis of the smell. We can also install a trail of scent that they can follow with the blind smell stick. It can be used in exhibition to draw visitors' attention to smells in our society. The blind smell stick consists of a number of components that ensure that smells are drawn quickly and without any dust into the, the hollow parts of the stick and are transported via pipe to the user's nose. Another device that goes well uh, with the blind smell is the blind smell touch. The blind smell touch is a glove that allows you to smell objects, food, plants, and persons at arm's length. So, and I would like to also to introduce here some works that are part of my research of combining scent with 3D printing, the odophones. The odophones are scent instruments based on music or sound instruments. Like here, you see the odorn, a scent instrument based on a horn. It makes a lot of noise and it's possible to combine three fragrances to blow them with the sound into the air or the scent flute which actually doesn't make much sound and only combine the smells of three added fragrances, which are put on polymers. Or in here is the same scent flute, but then in combination with an air ball. And this rattle, which I call the other rattle, let you experience a nice smell while you shake it well. Or here in combination with three fragrances. These are just a few scent in, uh, music instruments. Um, also experiments. There are also the other uh, drum, uh, a drum that gives uh, sound and smell, and scented trumpets, which makes it possible to create scent composition in the air just by playing the trumpet. I see also possibilities to make scented instruments to learn the alphabet. It's an example of how to use uh, the use of the alphabet, which we're, uh, we talk later about, has a lot of ways to use in life.
So I want to end my introduction by mentioning not only the information of the Lille 3000 Utopian exhibition, but also the exhibition in the south of France at the International um, Museum of Perfume in Grasse. In the exhibition, Breathing in Art, I show two olfactory installations, smoke room, a room covered with more than 750,000 used cigarette butts, and my new scent installation, Revival, a chair covered with dried immortals, everlasting flowers, standing on a carpet of pure dry blue lavender. For who's interested in more info about my works, I would like to refer to my olfactory book, uh, an overview book from 2016, uh, so uh, there are still some copies, I think, available at the publisher website. And the book consists out of more than 700 words of art and very interesting articles written by myself and by Dr. Hussian Chu and uh, Dr. Karo Verbeek. So I thank you all. And uh, yeah, this, this was my little introduction. Thank you, Peter. That's really, uh, really great. And it, it's also very good to see that your, your work is not only very poetic, but also socially engaged and, and searching for solutions that have to do with the climate change and, and so forth. So very rich presentation. Thank you very much. And right. uh, one of those uh, socially engaged works, uh, you could say you mentioned it already, is the work that you uh, developed in collaboration with seven in visually impaired people, amongst which Pete de Vos. Uh, uh, and this was an olfactory system of reading text for the blind, uh, namely an olfactory alphabet, which was uh, developed further on from, from the organ, I'll, I'll call it, uh, that you showed us. So Pete, uh, you are an author, a translator and literary scholar. And at the age of five, you became blind due to retinal cancer. These experiences of illness and disability are very important for you, uh, for who you are today, sorry. They have shaped you as a person, as a writer and researcher, but also as an activist for a greener and more inclusive world. In the preparatory conversation, you mentioned disability as a creative source and the importance of how disability is linked to ecology, its habitat, including whether traffic lights have sound or not, which I found really, um, well, we some, sometimes really need to be pointed out to that as, as people who see that uh, it doesn't work all the same. So uh, I think um, Alexander is going to share an image now, and you will uh, give an introduction to your work. Thank yeah. you. Um, so yeah, good evening to, to all of you. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Vos. I'm uh, indeed a writer and uh, well, a researcher, um, mainly of uh, the census and, and disability. Um, so yeah, to just start my uh, personal notes as a as a child, indeed, I, I lost my eyesight at the age of five, as it is uh, already mentioned in her introduction. Um, but I kept on thinking very visually. So, uh, because th this is one of the first cliches, and there are so many, about disabilities which exist that blindness would mean that you live in complete darkness. Well, that's absolute nonsense. For most people uh, who have um, a, a very low or no eyesight, uh, there is no such thing as darkness. If you still have some light or color perception, uh, so uh, there is no darkness. For people who are really completely blind from birth, they usually don't think in a visual way, so their world is more organized in other sensory ways. And then you have a group like uh, people like me who lost their eyesight at a later age, which means that you usually keep on thinking in quite visual way, or at least uh, you can remember many images. And that's also my case. So, um, and it's even, it has in my case quite strong components, which I only realized when I was eight or so in the classroom, when uh, uh, I just wrote a text and I, uh, in Braille, so with the Braille dots, uh, on a typewriter, bill typewriter, and I told my teacher uh, then that, well, that I loved so much the colors of the text, and she really didn't understand what I was talking about, because, you know, it was only, yeah, dots embossed in a white page, so there was no ink on it. 
Um, so then I suddenly realized that I saw this page differently than she did. Uh, so she, as a sighted person, she, she just saw white dots. For me, they were all colored letters. And uh, so this was when I discovered that I had synesthesia. Of course, I didn't know, I didn't know the word back then. It's something I discovered, discovered later on, that this is the current term for it in psychology and neurology. But it means that your brain, uh, that in your brain, one sense is being filtered through the other. Uh, so in my case, whenever I hear sounds, music, language, uh, then the, let, the sounds are turned into color. So I can't perceive any sounds without a color. And um, so every letter in my alphabet has a fixed color. And it seems that this is a, um, yeah, a, a connection, a brain connection, which exists in, uh, it's just an estimate, but I think one in 15 uh, people. And uh, usually it's sound and color, but it can also be, uh, it can also be done or it also exists in other forms. I, once I met a perfumer from Montreal who turns, uh, who actually uh, derives her perfumes from music. So when she hears music, then she also smells imaginary uh, scents. So th there are other other connections there, but in my case, it sounds and color. So this was something I realized uh, as a child and, and which kept on triggering me as, uh, yeah, you know, that there are so many ways to experience the world in different ways. And uh, so it triggered my interest for, for sensory perception. And this would be, yeah, an, an, a general kind of motive in my work later on as a writer and as a researcher. Um, so uh, when I, I did my, uh, MPhil and later on my PhD in literary studies, uh, I focused on poetry from the early 20th century. And then I actually looked into how this poetry was being influenced by the sensory culture of that time. So that, that sounds maybe a bit abstract, but it's like, for example, um, how poets would use, would use cinematic montage. So they were really fascinated by uh, the new film industry uh, coming on by cinema. And they would use like montage techniques, new visual techniques in their writing. Um, and so I, I wrote about uh, this kind of techniques and how they, you know, the visual culture of those days did influence poetry. Um, and also uh, more the tactile and the, the haptic, so the, the touch of, of those days, uh, how that influenced French surrealism. Uh, if you like me, I can later on develop a bit on that. But uh, so you have to think about eroticism, violence, uh, but all kinds of, of bodily mechanisms which influenced uh, the surrealists by creating their poetry. Uh, so uh, my, my first focus was mainly on the history of visuality and, and touch. Um, but more recently, I've been more focusing on this ability and how this also influences uh, the way people perceive the world. So, of course, I had my own experience uh, on that level to, to delve into. But now, uh, since uh, I think it's now six or seven years, I've been uh, doing uh, my research in more structural uh, ways. So now I um, write about art or, um, or literature, which thanks to disability, uh, yeah, develops new ways of uh, representing the world. Uh, so that can be about a blind writer. It can also be about the presentation or the use of the senses in literature. Uh, and so on. So that's not specifically focused on smell or, or it can be on any on any sense actually. Um, but so that's uh, very, very shortly what my, yeah, uh, what my scientific work is about. Uh, I also, if, if people are interested in my creative writing, uh, I have to say sensory perception is also crucial there. 
There is, for example, a short story which I wrote two or three years ago, Missing Child in the Mirror, in which I imagine an exhibition of a sculpture which the visitor needs to um, explore by touch in a dark room, uh, while the sculpture is actually talking to the visitor. And um, so that's mainly done. I, I wrote this story mainly to reflect on our uh, typical ways of, of exhibiting art. Like for example, sculpture is such a tactile art while in, the, in, in general, we are never allowed to touch sculpture. And many sculptors also tell me that, that they actually, yeah, they, they actually regret it. Of course, there is a fact and the danger of damaging uh, uh, an artwork. So that's always difficult. So you have to find ways to make to do it more delicately. But it is a, a pity that so many art, so much art is just, uh, uh, focused on visual on, on visuality or presented just in a visual way. While it can be so much richer, I think, more in a more multi-century uh, context. And now to make the connection with Peter's work, which I uh, really profoundly admire in all its complexity and richness. Uh, but I also had a pleasure to to work with Peter for uh, an exhibition last year in Bruges and Leuven, where I was one of the curators together with uh, the blind sculptor, uh, Tony Eindenkleef. And uh, they asked us to tell there the history of the education of the blind in Belgium. Uh, for this, we need to go back to the, to the early 19th century when the first schools for the blind were created. And um, back then, one of the major problems was how to make uh, blind children read and write. And uh, throughout the centuries, many uh, yeah, fantastic ideas were uh, developed and, and, and tried. So um, uh, Braille, the dots, was certainly not the first uh, system. Uh, they also experimented with a lot of embossed printing, so with lead letters and so on, so that you could actually feel the Latin alphabet, so like the like a sighted person reads but then just in an embossed way so that they could touch and, and feel it. But this process was very hard to produce. Uh, it was hard to and, and very expensive to produce such books. And then Louis Braille, who was himself a blind student in Paris, uh, thought of a much more simpler system with dots which you could prick with a needle into paper. And actually, uh, it's such a genius idea because it's so simple and so easy to make. Uh, and the Braille code is actually very easy. If you know the first 10 letters of the alphabet, you can reproduce all the rest and all the numbers. It's actually uh, uh, very simple. So uh, I think that Braille was such a success. It just, um, it also has to do with the tactile cell of our fingers, uh, which is just big enough to feel one letter in Braille. So that's another genius point of, um, of the Braille system. So this uh, actually showed the way to how to read with your fingers, so by touch. So we can take into information through other senses than the eyes and the ears. Language can be produced in, in other sensory ways. And this clearly also inspired Peter um, to, to develop the alphabet. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I don't know how yeah, much I can okay. tell, the, but it was yeah. on the it was part of our exhibition anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Pete. The, there's two things uh, that might be interesting. Um, first, your your talk about synesthesia, and we can come back to that because uh, someone like Vasily Kandinsky was very famous for that because he uh, literally saw colors when he heard music, and heard music when he painted. And when you talked about uh, regretting the fact that uh, sculpture cannot be touched, there's actually at the moment um, an exhibition uh, in Rouen that I haven't seen or touched yet, which is called as a um, uh, clin d'oeil uh, to Duchamp, of course, it's called uh, Prier de Toucher. Uh, so yeah, it, uh, right, Duchamp okay. made this... Yeah. this um, this breast that you, you were invited to touch. And okay. that's actually an exhibition uh, with um, copies of works by the, uh, four, no, five museums in France um, that you are uh, 
invited to touch. So uh, maybe a reason to uh, pay a visit to, to a wall. Um, but uh, I know that Peter has prepared um, something around the alphabet to show to the audience. Yeah, I've prepared a little uh, explanation how the alphabet works and about the project uh, uh, Pete and I and uh, all the, uh, the six other visual and blind uh, people, uh, visually impaired people and blind people uh, have realized. So the alphabet, when sense becomes letters. Um, it was recently also on show in the Museum of Craft and Design in San Francisco, created by Elizabeth Pissot and Clara Muller. Um, and uh, uh, but let's start about the realization of the alphabet. So I worked together with uh, Dr. Pete De Vos here and uh, with fantastic, amazing person, uh, which I know since a few years, and I'm always impressed by uh, his knowledge about the census. And uh, with uh, six other blind and visually impaired people to make the selection of the fragrances. Without them, the alphabet would never have left the drawing board. Uh, every cent ambassador, that's the way I call them, has made a unique contribution to the development of this beautiful sensory project based on their own lived experiences. It was first shown and created for the exhibition uh, The World Within Reach, uh, that Pete just uh, mentioned, and created by him and Tonya Indeclave, um, uh, who is uh, also visually impaired. Um, and, and uh, because of the COVID safety reasons, I had to install food pumps to activate the 26 cent letters. So the exhibition was also developed that also blind people could visit and experience and test the alphabet in that way. So how does it work? Imagine that you can read and uh, words and text just by smelling. With every breath, we unconsciously smell. By linking specific scents to letters, you can expand our ability to read and learn. The concept is easy. Every letter is linked to a fragrance, scent molecule, which you can learn. Words are formed from a combination of several others, and from words come sentences. For every letter, there is a scent molecule used. Reading more scents create a word, words become scent compositions. For the scent in the letter modules, I use scented polymers. This is already a research by itself. Uh, the smell is concentrated to the letter and can be smelled for months, even more than a year, depending on which fragrance is used. And this without the need to add new fragrance. Luckily, nowadays, there are many possibilities for blind people to obtain information. For example, most mobile phones are equipped, equipped to help them with audio advice. That's something I learned also from Pete. But not everyone can handle this. So, but the alphabet is also not intended to replace, in, general, in one way, the Braille script. On the uh, contrary, it's an addition or a possible alternative. There are also blind people who are deaf and who do not have the ability to read with their fingers. Uh, then the alphabet might be a solution. It is also a wrong idea that all blind people can read Braille. There are many blind people who do not succeed in mastering Braille. Like Tonya here with her dog, Victoria, she can read Braille, but after just a long time, she told me she still has difficult to read it fast. Or Frankie, uh, here on the photo also, who weaves sh shares for a living. Because of this, his hands are very rough and it is also more difficult for him to read Braille good at certain moments. There are also other advantages to use Braille. With Braille, you have the feeling I have to feel letter after letter, uh, which is time consuming. With the alphabet, you have the possibility to read words by letter, uh, words by learning scent composition. Take the word school, for example. Uh, they have to feel the letters, uh, every letter, S-C-H-O-O-L, before they have read the whole world, a word. Uh, while with the alphabet, they can learn uh, to read the scent composition of all the fragrance letters of the word, of the word school by its own so they can learn to read faster. The alphabet allows letters, words, and sentences to be translated into sense, thus creating an alpha language. Imagine what it would be uh, uh, to be able to translate a digital text into an olfactory one, simple by breathing in. The alpha readers make it possible to read faster. The idea behind it is that with every breath, we take a smell. The alpha readers are conceptualized to activate the next scented letter, or smell word by word, 
uh, the way you you breathe. The faster or the harder you breathe, the more letters or words you will smell. This is a conceptual idea at the moment. Nevertheless, in combination with a remote control system, there should be a realistic solution that can be realized in the future. Before I end my short presentation of the alphabet, I would like to show two screenshots from the end of the documentary of the making of the alphabet, which tells in a way the future will give the answer if it's possible or not. One thing is, one thing is for sure, it is possible to read by smelling, but a lot of research still needs to be done uh, to make it work, uh, work in society. As an artist, I must also leave this to more applied researchers. I started from an artistic project and provided and proved uh, that it's functionally possible, which suddenly gave it an applied value. Further research uh, needs to be done, but for that, other scientists need to get involved. I am thinking of a psychologist, linguists, a specialist in artificial intelligence, and of course, more sense specialist, but that needs budget. I see even more possibilities with the alphabet to send it to the universe with the NASA, as by my knowing, there has never sent a chemical language to the universe. And maybe if there's alien life, it might be that they communicate on a non-visible and non-auditive way. I should contact Elon Musk or Bezos. Uh, if someone has uh, their phone number, let me know. <laughs> However, there are more ways to integrate the alphabet, uh, like send signs in the city to warn people or in war to communicate by smelling secret languages, uh, messages. And we also unconsciously smell it, uh, uh, the idea of unconsciously to sm smelling uh, as maybe possibilities, like learning while we are sleeping. It are just thoughts, but as an artist, thinking out of the box brought me further than staying aside in my safe zone. And I love to end uh, this news that the alphabet got the honors to receive the Public International New Technology Award in uh, March this year, which is a great honor to receive. Uh, in reply to the call for entries for the International Contest New Technology Art Award, NTAA 2022, 836 candidates representing 72 nationalities worldwide have applied. But of these projects, an, an international jury has selected 20 nominees, for which Alphabet received the, finally uh, the public award. Also, it's at the moment nominated for the prestigious Art and Affection Award, awarded by the Institute of Art and Affection in Los Angeles. So people believe in it and are not blind for it. Thank you all. Well, congratulations, uh, Peter, and, and, and thanks for, for this um, um, uh, <coughs> explanation of the alphabet, and maybe we can talk a bit further about it, uh, because it, it, it's very intriguing. I, ca I cannot completely imagine how it would work. I imagine that, uh, because you're not afraid, uh, in, the, in my introduction I talked about this recent research, uh, which uh, found out that... that uh, all over the world, people seem to to like the same smells. But you're not afraid to also use really disgusting smells like those of cigarette butts, which I, I had the pleasure, between brackets, to smell <laughs> myself. Uh, uh, but um, would the the alphabet uh, be a combination of of, of attractive smells and and uh, repel repulsive smells? Uh, it's, it's, I think it's, it is still a lot of research yeah. um, to realize the, I to make the selection of the fragrances. Um, I asked the advice of uh, uh, Pete and the other uh, blind and visible impaired people. So they may choose between uh, 52 fragrances I selected before mm -hmm. based on categories and uh, they selected each 26 uh, cents from it. And then I make a comparison and use their selection I only, add, I only uh, uh, selected one fragrance, and that's the O, uh, which is an aldehyde C18, which smells a little bit to cocos. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, I think uh, the reaction most of the time is when it smells bad, they're not so, um, with the selection process, they're not so open for it in general. But I think it, it's necessary to use also sometimes some repulsive uh, uh, fragrances in it. For example, to make a question mark or a point or something mm -hmm. can be very interesting to 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 use that or uh, uh, to to give more expression to the the communication also uh, how it should be done I think there's still a lot of research mm 
I think with the selection that was made now, because there were also some uh, essential oils in it, um, uh, it it's, it's still not possible to read it perfectly. Uh, I think there should be more like, uh, uh, have to be looked to the combination of the frags when you put them next to each other, that you can differentiate them perfectly more. But uh, it's a huge uh, research to do that because yeah, there's yeah. so many uh, letter combinations, so also yeah. so many uh, scent combinations, mm -hmm. and uh, that you still can read it very easily. Um, so, so um, yeah, it, it, it's 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 there's still to be done a lot of research for that. Yeah, yeah and I, I guess so. So Pete was involved in this. So were you and and I. I Suppose you did some testing. So, Pete, did, were you able actually to read uh, via the smells? Well, to read uh, that would mean too much. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, uh, I was so. For instance, uh, the first uh, step also, I, I, I really loved to, to try just to select and and uh, find, um, yeah, uh, the most. Uh, um, appealing uh, fragrances, uh, which doesn't mean exactly the most, the nicest one, I have to say. It could also be the most interesting or the richest one. And then also, uh, as Peter just said, to find uh, the most uh, differentiated ones, uh, because that's important, I think, that you can differentiate. Uh, because otherwise, it's uh, certainly after a while, um, then, then uh, you know, it's harder to distinguish the smells uh, if, if you have been smelling for a while. And if you're not a, a trained uh, smeller, uh, a nose, like we might call them, uh, like, like, like Peter is, or, or other scent specialists. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but it was really intriguing to do. And, and afterwards, I, I would try to read short words and so on. But I think it would require a lot of training, like actually also reading uh, another kind of alphabet also requires a lot of training. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, nowadays, we're really having this craze of, of all kinds of perfumes and uh, having candles and, and d uh, smell diffusers in, in, in our homes, but actually that is maybe also distorting uh, our, our, our capability of really making differences between all kinds of smells. Um, uh, because smell is is not is is actually really important for both humans and non-humans um, for their survival. Actually, so I don't know if if one of you can can uh, discuss that a bit further. Uh, how smell is important to for survival? Yeah, it, I think it's very important. But maybe first to uh, to alternate on what you said before, like uh, when there for example for example there's another fragrance in the air. Uh, and you want to read with it, um, it's still possible, but because you climatize, you climatize on a, a certain situation. And with the, the alphabet, you smell each letter after each other very quickly and separate. So that, that works in that way. Um, but but uh, scent is very important in, in general, also to, as a warning system. I think when we smell some smoke, we know there could be fire. Um, uh, but, but but also for memory, it's very important. So there, there's also the question when you create this uh, scent alphabet, um, some people will link it maybe to other situations, something it's, uh, which can also be with visual letters, I think, with, for some people. So it's important when uh, people would want to re uh, learn it, they have to learn it from when they are little. I think like like uh, they should learn the letter system that we know, like uh, the, the the visuality of a letter that we can read it, and to create a kind of uh, word image, then they have to learn to 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 read the the scent image, which are scent compositions of the word. So it's 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 uh, in that way it's it, it can work. Um, but yeah, it's it's. Uh, yeah. I, can uh, I, I just, yeah, just a small note here uh, is that uh, when I had to select the fragrances for the alpha alphabet, uh, I was also met very much relying on my synesthetic alphabet. So when I, I smelled a certain scent, which somehow evoked a certain color, um, I, I'm not such a, a smell a synesthet, but still, uh, but still, I mean, there are some like mints, for example. Mint for me uh, evokes a blue whiteness, something like that. And um, 
So the, 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 the A in my, my alphabet is white. So uh, for me, it was clear that I, I needed some, like for the A, like very fresh kind of scent, mint or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. And, and for, um, well, for as said, for both humans and non-humans, smell is, is also very important for survival or finding safety or danger. As you said, fire is maybe very easy, but it's also the smell maybe of, of uh, home or parents or a safe environment that is important? Uh, definitely, yeah. I think it's the most important uh, sense <laughs> um, because uh, with every breath, we breathe in and uh, and to to live we need to breathe you know we, we need to get air and uh, so so for me it's a sign that 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 it's a very important uh, sense um so uh, uh it warns us it's also uh, important for our social lives uh, sexuality also for food it has a reason that our nose coming out of our heads in one way so when we eat that it, it's and that we first smell it before we start to eat it so it has a lot of uh, functionality and uh, sometimes people forget it. But the danger is also a little bit that people will lose it in, in the future, I think. When you think about uh, uh, the metaverse that's, that's developing, for example, now at the moment and uh, the, how it will be in the future when there will be also the fragrances with uh, headspace uh, devices that you can uh, have a kind of realistic effect when you see something happening in the metaverse or something you can also smell it it looks uh, from a, a far away but there are still there are already devices where it can use nine fragrances uh, so um, and they they felt trying to develop uh, devices that can uh, cover all the all the uh, scents or, or smells that you can discover imagine that they can do it um, I, I can imagine that people get used to to very uh, nice uh, fragrances and get an other view on the world, an, a non-realistic view on the world. So I think it's important in education that they still learn that there, there is an importance of the warning fun function, for example, from smell. We can smell very good. We can, we, people say that we have a not so good smell as, a, as dogs. Of, co of course, we cannot smell so intensively, but we can also find, uh, there's a uh, research that proved that we can smell a trail also, but we just have to go on our, uh, with our hands and feet on the ground and uh, with our nose to, to the ground to, to smell it and we can follow it also. So it's, uh, we, we, we think it's not so powerful, but actually it's so powerful what you can do yeah. with it. But what, would you, what you're just describing is probably used by, by, by many indigenous people all around the world that, that are still capable of smelling trails. And, and the, the history of covering, I mean, I said we today are very busy doing that, but of obviously that has been also quite a while that perfumes were used to cover bad smells, of, uh, especially of people. Uh, what you were talking about with, with smell in the metaverse made me think of uh, a question that I had wanted to pose to uh, Pete, because I was very interested in, in your work uh, linking the senses to the cultural avant-garde to, to which you alluded in your introduction. And um, amongst others to surrealism and Benjamin Perrier. And um, I wondered whether this sensory approach of literature could also include an olfactory experience in a way comparable maybe to the smell of vision at the movies from the 60s, but actually also this development of, of smell in the metaphors maybe. Yeah, um, yes. So we have, of course, we have a problem with, with language uh, and, um, and, and smells on another level. The, set, the problem is that in Western languages, uh, we often lack uh, exact words and terms for, for smells. Um, I mean, we usually, we use a lot of metaphors to describe uh, smells. So we talk about it's sweet, it's sharp, it's like a rose, it's like this or that, but it is hard to, uh, to really use olfactory words for it. Uh, so we are not, our, our, our languages are not very rich in olfactory, um, uh, an olfactory vocabulary. Um, that's that's uh, obviously uh, pointing at, let's say, the, um, 
yeah underestimated uh, position of smell in in our in our hierarchy of the senses right i mean in in western thinking visuality predominates as a source of knowledge that's very clear and and the, yeah se uh, the sense of, of of smell is certainly um underestimated uh, uh, if it comes to its importance etc so yeah uh, in literature, uh, we all know the example of Patrick Suskind, but it's it's a rare one. And it's um, there are uh, there there is, for example, a very nice futuristic poem by uh, Marinetti, uh, which is called "The Olfactory Portrait of a Woman," and that's really trying to describe uh, a woman in 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 the richness of, of sense. And, and it's really much richer than just a perfume or tobacco. It's really, uh, it includes a lot of metaphors. So that's really a very great example of, of the avant-garde where, where sand, the, the, the smells are really turned into, into literature. Um, but it is certainly, it is not easy. Uh, I mean, if, if I look at most poetry that are uh, like visual, auditory, haptic, so touch metaphors predominate clearly. Um, but yeah, there are examples. I mean, the French surrealists, for example, uh, would also use fragrances in their exhibitions. So the idea was to make a very multi-sensory experience that would, uh, yeah, defamiliarize and shock the spectators uh, throughout. I mean, throughout their whole body. So they would use all kinds of like coffee smells, exotic Brazilian coffee smells. Uh, for example, in, in one of their exhibitions. Yes, uh, so they, they did use it. Um, but yeah, that was not exactly, uh, let's say, uh, in, in, yeah, connected to literature. So it's, um, uh, yeah, th there is still a lot to explore there, I think. Well, actually, your remark uh, really connects to an, uh, another question uh, for Peter because you wrote your PhD on how smell can be used as both a concept and context of work in the artist artistic design process. And in an article you talk about olfactory transfers which you divide into five categories, flowers, smell devices, sorry, flowers, smell devices, scent spaces, time and translations. Um, so I'd, I'd love to you to expand on this. And one of my students actually recently used a smell diffuser in an installation of hers, and I wondered whether you think that is is a sign of the times we're living in or or, or not. But um, oh, I'm sure it's a sign of time. I think it's the the nearby sensors getting more attention in the uh, uh, exhibition. Uh, also, food getting more use of food and uh, uh, the, the tasting. Uh, get, getting more attention, but the tactility is for, for sure. And also smell, uh, factory art is growing. There are many more students coming who, who use it. And Lil, for example, there was um, a few students applied to, to assist me there from, from Lil. So um, um, also in our school, I'm teaching olfactory uh, art or every year, uh, quite a lot of uh, students that subscribe to, 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 to learn it. So. Um, and I think internationally, there's getting more interest in it. In Chicago, you have also in this SIAC, uh, there are also a, a little course that can follow olfactory art. It's so also in education, it starts to, to getting more attention, which is very good. And I think it's really a sign of the time because uh, I think people wa want to go also to Mesea and to do something interactive with Marley because they can see also, for me, when I see a painting, I still want to see it in real. But I think for a lot of young people, uh, they are used to, to to see things on the screen. So so uh, a good way to learn them to go to museum is to to have works where they have to um, be there to experience them, which which an advantage by its own. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's also another way to give um, context to a work or uh, st start questioning things. But I will maybe share a very short presentation I prepared about uh, all factory yeah, transfers. Yeah. So it's 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 was part of. Uh, for my uh, PhD, I will research how can I use it as a concept, uh, the scent in general, and also to divide in a little bit what are the most important things in, in, in a work of art. So the way we experience a smell can also have influence on the concept of the work and even on the context, uh, a context of, of uh, the situation where it's in. 
And there are a lot of ways to perceive smell. I've divided them so in flower, smell devices, sense space, time, and translations. So uh, when we looked at it, I, I made some uh, uh, keywords for them. A smell concept, which refer is the concept of how smell is transmitted uh, through the work. The smell source refers to where the smell comes from. The smell transfer refers to the purpose for which fragrance is transferred where. Uh, the spectator indicates whether the spectator is passively or actively involved in the smell and the work and the experience. Does the viewer experience the work of art as an object directed, spatially, uh, spatially uh, directed, or is it a um, discovering uh, purpose? And then there are the crossovers, which are crossovers from the above uh, key keywords, you could say. So uh, I explain very shortly then, uh, uh, so the flowers. So, so what are flowers? I see flowers um, more, uh, it's for me more than just a flower. It's a visible horn to society, an outlet, uh, a scream. Flowers are a metaphor. Uh, it, gives, it gives so much more meaning to the concept uh, of a flower, the idea of a metaphor. Uh, not an Italy of beauty, but a beer of meaning. A flower gives a message. It makes the viewer think and question the beauty of society. Flower is not seen here as a purely aesthetic fact, but as a beer of meaning. The flower as a fragrance producer, fragrance factory, uh, a perfect image of beauty is not only important for the olfactory approach to the concept of flower, but also as a horn speaker to society. A flower can thus also be an opening in the ground or wall that emits a smell, like you see here. Um, it, it is uh, like a, a symbolic funnel, as it were an outlet or an open mouth that screams smells. A sewer or a windpipe in the wall, a car exhaust or a factory chimney can also carry the concept of flower for me, but with a more critical reflection through use of smell and context. The glands on the skin of a body, the hairs on the arm, armpits, the body opening, even genitals can be seen as flowers in the sense of a metamorphosis. If one can experience the concept of flower in this way, one will understand that this concept is closely related to the relationship between society, nature, and culture. A flower always contains a fragrance and thus has at least one other containing component. The fragrant component being a sort of fragrance in the object work of art itself. The object work of art also has a scent diffusing effect that is purposeful. This purposeful effect ensures that the scent actively or passively involves the viewer. And a smell device refers to the action of smelling itself. In other words, being stimulated to smell and thus becoming more aware of the action uh, that's taking place. In the case of a smell device, the spectator himself must participate by using a device in order to be able to smell better, become more aware of what's, uh, what one is doing, undertaking and observing. It can be seen as an extension of the nose or an attachment to better perceive the smell. Although the, the concept sounds logical, confusing could arise if the smell device were also a kind of flower at the same time. For example, a device could itself emit a scent if the viewer has to take the action to smell something that refers to an unreal connected scent. Fragrance, like with the other telescope, um, it's an uh, instrument where you can smell from distance. Uh, fragrance by its own can also be smell devices when the, their purpose is to initiate inside the, the viewer to smell through the use of the scent in order to acquire meaning. The purpose of smelling is then not to consider the smell itself as a value tool, but rather to use the smell as a tool to incite the viewer to smell. Also a stamp used to set the spectator to action to smell can be seen as a smell device, while the body is seen here as a flower. So by allowing spectators to do things themselves, to investigate and to make extinct, uh, effective observations through experience, they also start to believe that it is real because smell devices are objects that they have to handle themselves to determine, determine a smell. They are also more likely to believe that it's true. Then in, in a sense space, the spectator experiences the scent uh, with his whole body. The smell hangs in the uh, space as it were and gives a certain experience. This experience can be both contextual and purely an experience. A sense space is a location, 
situation where the scent is already present or changing. A scent space is a scent experience in which the location of the scent is not necessarily known. A scent space can contain a reference to the scent diffusion, but this should be the subject to the experience and also give context to the scent experience. A scent space can be contextual as well as purely an experience. And due to its uh, volatile uh, character, smell also has a limit time of existence unless it is supplemented or replaced in time. Smell can also change over time and depends on the humidity, temperature, and situation in which it's located. Of all of factory transfer, first uh, time is perhaps the most ungraspable. It therefore plays a role in most of the olfactory transfers. The ephemeral character of a fragrance already relates to the concept of time. The viewer can only pay, uh, passively, passively experience the limited shelf life of the work unless it is actively involved in uh, optimizing the smell, in which case it will also be an active part of the work. However, the artist will usually include the optimi optimization of the smell as a concept in his work and ensure that the smell always meets the requirements he himself sets for it. Then olfactory translations or scent translations through the other senses. They can occur over time to the loss of a smell whereby the smell memory remains in the material. In addition, they can be conceptual references to smell and the influences of smells and how this context and or concept of the work can be. A fine example from art history is the work Belle Hélène by Marcel Duchamp. The, uh, the perfume bottle is empty and closed. It is also not the intention that the bottle is smelled, but that the work is visibly perceived in relationship to the emptiness of the bottle. It's therefore part of the olfactory transfers, uh, translations. And there are uh, many more, but most of the uh, olfactory concepts will be crossovers between these olfactory transfers. Like smoke cloud, for example, here, uh, which is a flower, but at the same time, it's also a scent space because you put your head inside of it and you're also going to the center of, uh, it, it, it also emits the scent at the same time. So here we see an overview of the olfactory transfer. So and um, maybe I end with uh, just saying that uh, smells are more than just air particles. They give context and imagination in many dimensions. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, when scent makes seeing, when seeing makes sense. And thank you, uh, Peter. Actually, um, and uh, it's it's interesting that we've been joined by Annemarie Maas in the meantime, and uh, I was happy to see her installation, the scent space, I, I would say, uh, in uh, Eur Sauvage, which is an exhibition which only takes place this week, isn't it? Uh, in uh, the Centre Wallonie, Bruxelles, where uh, Annemarie uh, shows an installation which is uh, called I Talk to You About the Flowers and the Colors and the Smells, and for which you developed a smell uh, together with uh, Guélain Paris, which is wonderful, which smells mainly of lavender, I had the impression. Would you mind saying a bit about that? We have a... Yeah. Hello, good afternoon. Oh. Is it working? No? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I can quickly say a few words. Actually, um, the one um, in uh, the Centre Wallonie Bruxelles in Paris, um, where it mentioned Guerlain, this was not with Guerlain. Ah, but okay, okay. It but it was the week before at the Palais de Tokyo I developed. Yeah, and I couldn't, I couldn't uh, uh, be there, unfortunately. But yeah. it smelled lovely in the installation <laughs> in, yeah. in yeah. the Centre Wallonie Bruxelles as well. Yeah, but that was real lavender. Ah. That was okay. real, simply lavender. Okay. 10 kilograms of lavender. Yeah. So it smelled a lot. And the wonderful thing was that the bees, the, the wild bees, they came and they smelled it. And they came uh, from, yeah, the, the, uh, les alentours uh, the <laughs> du centre. And they came to smell and uh, turn around the speakers, but also on the lavender very quickly. Yeah. 
they discovered, of course, that it was not a living plant, so, uh, but um, they stayed and they, they, they were really, truly interested. Yeah. But um, the one that I developed with Gerlin um, was uh, the smell of the beehive, where I um, talked a lot with uh, the two um, noses, of two of the noses of Gerlin that developed a perfume afterwards. And I told them about my experiences as a beekeeper. When you open uh, the cover of a beehive, uh, every a bee colony has its own smell like we humans have our own smell also. Um, so um, we talked a lot about the, the sweet and the warmth and the activity and also uh, the, um, uh, the, the sweat, actually. It's a sweat smell also in the bee colony. So um, this, they, de they developed later in a perfume. Uh, two different ones that I worked with during the performance. Um, and one was based very much on honey, which was very sweet, sweet, warm one. It uh, smells lovely. And the other one was more based on, I call it the wild animal thing. I think it's on a basis more of patchouli kind of stuff uh, mm. to start with. Well, thank you. Uh, it, it, it's interesting that, that the notion of, of, because we hardly think about that. I mean, uh, you both, Peter and Peter, have, have already referred to the fact that we sort of forget how important smell is. Uh, although we are com have been confronted with it lately uh, due to COVID, where people uh, unfortunately might lose their, s their, their sense of smell and, and also their sense of taste. But the idea that, that a bee can smell is, is well, in a way, it's may be obvious, but uh, I find it really interesting that you told about the fact that, that the bees were, uh, would come and, and turn around uh, the, the moment and they think, oh, it's only the smell, it's n there's nothing more than that. So, um, Yeah, actually it's, it's true because normally we say like the bees are attracted by the flowers due to the, the, um, the physical forms of the flowers and they see they have a different vision spectrum and they are attracted by indicators of the flowers to attract them to go to the, spa to the places where the nectar is. But here it was just buds of lavender, dried lavender, that was still uh, smelling a lot. And they were actually smelling also on that. So um, quickly they discovered that it was not for them, but uh, they were attracted only like by the smell. So. Yeah, it, 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 it seems to me that this is uh, also very much connected to the fact that it's not that long ago that uh, researchers actually became more aware of the fact that animals talk amongst each other. And, and when I first uh, saw that, that they were amazed about it, I thought, well, why wouldn't they? Uh, so why wouldn't they talk amongst each other? So it, I guess it's also the question, why wouldn't uh, animals smell? Um, I would like to open up the floor maybe to the audience. I don't know whether there's any questions uh, amongst you or remarks. No. We've been very clear, <laughs> apparently. Um, is there anything else that, that, that uh, you both want to, want to add to, to the conversation, Pete or, or Peter? Keep on smelling, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One moment. Please keep the mic very close to your mouth. Okay. Like this. Okay. Um, so I was wondering if you ever considered doing the translation of the alphabet more conceptually um, instead of just translating each letter. Because for example, I was just thinking about if you, for example, if it's gonna, if scents together are gonna represent school, well, it's hard to tell like how scents compose. You can't really imagine what individual um, scents are going to create. And I was just wondering if you thought about that and if you think there might be a discordance with the scent that is created for a word and what it means to the person who is smelling it. Um, I don't think I understand the question very good. It, it's maybe, can, can you repeat? Uh, um, yeah, okay, okay, let me try to rephrase it. Okay, so 
for the alphabet, um, as I understand, you are assigning a scent for each of the letters. Um, but I was wondering if you ever thought about, I guess, instead of assigning it to each of the le letters of more of compositions that would go to certain words? Because, oh, yeah. because it's difficult uh, yeah, to... Yeah, but, but I think it would be, um, like, for example, the word cross, you could use a smell that smells like cross. Um, it, there are also some ideas from it, but then it makes it more complex when you go... Um, uh, yeah, when you go to different locations, for example, when you have the, the word of flower, for example, uh, and for, for, for some countries you can, you can uh, use a typical flower that they recognize because it's a flower from their location, but it, in other countries they will not recognize it or something. It makes it also more complex to make the alphabet because you need them more fragrances, and now you only need 26 fragrances. So, um, I must say also about the frax, for example, the letter E, for example, cis 3 hexanol it's a, it's a smell that's, that you can find. It smells a little bit too gross in general, but you can find it also in uh, Granny Smith apples, but also in bananas, uh, in concumber. Uh, so it's our kind of molecules that that's our part already from, um, okay, yeah, that are part already from, from some uh, fragrances we know in general. So it makes it also easier to read them separately and also has to do also with uh, uh, making not your nose lazy. I want to say with this uh, alternate on that, that um, when you have to read a long time, I, I hear people thinking already from the yeah, but uh, after three fragrances, I get already lazy. And if you would work with, for example, with uh, a smell of grass, it's a quite complex smell by its own, or, or flower smell is quite complex. Or it exists out of a lot of uh, ingredients. And that's all the reason, for example, uh, one of the reasons uh, when you go to a perfumery and you smell three fragrances or three perfumes there, and uh, the fourth one, you have more difficult to, 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 to smell it. It has to do with two reasons. One is that there is a lot of alcohol in it. It makes your nose lazy, but also because it are compositions, they're very complex which is all make it uh, more more difficult to to refresh very quickly um, and when you use separate molecules it's much more easier to to refresh your nose because it's just you must much it's not that so intensive you, it goes quite quickly that you can detect it but it's practicing and i think that's that needs that that's the the question with all the things it's it's a uh, but I think also that, that Pete can uh, alternate on it when, when learning Braille, it, it, it's probably, it's also a long time you have to practice it. Um, uh, just for me to know the, the Braille letters, how they are, are created in one way, it's very simple system. It's, it's very perfect. It's, it's amazing. But, but between the visual seeing and how it is and feeling that you can recognize the the points and, and read each letter. It's so difficult. I discovered so it, mm -hmm. and it's also the same with uh, the alphabets. It will, it will need time to, time to learn it. But it makes it more easier when it are just molecules, scent molecules. And so essentially, it's every letter is supposed to be smelled separately, not together. Uh, you, yeah, no, no, no. You, you can smell them together. Like, like for example, if you want to create the word grass, you have the 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 the, the, the letters from the word the word that you can mix them together. When they when you put them quickly together in one scent, you have the scent composition. But you still can recognize them very easy because you learn how to make the comp the to, to read the compositions. It's like when I, I create a perfume, for example, and I think more, I think it's something typical for perfumers, I think in general, like, you know, already when you use a, a fragrance, how does it will uh, change your fragrance or how it will uh, uh, have another kind of uh, uh, experience with, with it. Um, or when you smell a fragrance, you can sometimes a composition, you can already detect, okay, wait, there's this fragrance in that fragrance. And when you know it already, you can smell it very quickly. You can meet it, say that, okay, these are these letters, but it's practicing. That's why so also in the beginning, you have to learn it letter by letter. As it's very sl slow. And then you can try to do it faster with the, the idea with the uh, other readers that, that uh, the author readers that that's the, the device will react on the way you are breathing in. So you, when you smell, you are breathing in very soft, you will smell very slowly letter per letter, or you can choose to breathe it in faster, or you can change the, 
the 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 uh, reaction of of, of uh, uh, how it should re um, should be translated when, when you read something digitally. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, I wanted to say it. It seems like like uh, effectively after some some time that you would be able to read diag diagonally or smell yeah. diagonally. Um, yeah. yeah. And and you referred uh, as did Anna Maria in fact to the the quality of the nose or the noses of of uh, that that develop perfumes who just like cooks sort of only have to look at at, a, at a, an ingredient and know what it will do to the to the final smell. Yeah. I guess yeah, yeah. that's yeah. that's a good example. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's you, you you can see sometimes with food already. Okay, how it will taste all together, but you, when you taste it, you know you taste the different ingredients, and it's the same with this uh, the the scent composition, the words that you would read, scent words that you would read. It Pete was was talking about maybe to finish because we're, we're well, we can talk about this for, forever, <laughs> I think maybe. But um, you were talking about how you uh, your synesthetic experience. Do do you also make a connection to? To taste, or is is that not at all the case? Because smell and taste are quite often connected, but I have no idea whether, um, apart from from smelling uh, a letter or, or 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 no, you, in your case it was giving a color to a letter. There's also a taste. Yeah, no, it's mainly in, in my case so sound and color. So this is really the, for me the automatic connection. So. Every letter has a certain color. And so let's say I can imagine uh, black letters on a white background. But if uh, I can imagine that, but after two mit minutes, I forget about it. And then they, they get on their, uh, yeah, for me, natural colors again. So um, that, that's the automatic thing about synesthesia. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I mean, like the word grass, for example, if you say that, then I see the the J, uh, G is, 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 is brown, R is red, A is white, and the S is, is yellow. So, uh, what, yeah, I, I kind of, that's immediately how it comes up. And uh, with smells and tastes, I, I can make associations, right? But it's not automatic, no. Okay, thank you. Well, um, if there's no other questions from the audience, I suggest we'll stop it here. I uh, really recommend, and I'm, I'm anxious to see it as well, the, the show of Peter at uh, Lille, uh, which uh, we can still visit until the 2nd of October. Uh, and uh, both Peter and uh, Peter Voss have very good websites, uh, petervoss.be and peterdecoupre.com, I think. Uh. Dot uh, art or dot com or dot net, uh, everything. Everything works. <laughs> yeah. Everything works. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for being there, uh, even on the screen. Uh, thanks to the audience. Thanks to email uh, and uh, laser. And this will be recorded, and I think it will be online soon. Yes, it's uh, well, it's already recorded and will be in line probably already without any editing this evening because it takes a little bit time for that it will be uh, in one piece. And uh, after with editing, we will have it, uh, I think, in one week with the presentation that will be just uh, included so that we can see it easily. And uh, it's again, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for coming. Thank you very much for Peter and Pete. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, for a next laser talk, maybe you will be joining us uh, here in October. I hope. Yeah, I certainly have to come over there. <laughs> Sorry, and I couldn't be there today. And yes. thank you very much, Imal and uh, Denny, for assume our uh, streaming. And uh, I think that we will continue, so just follow us. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you for having us. Bye. Bye. Bye.